Welcome everyone to our seminar number 212. And um, it's great that we, for the first time, we have uh, Eric Liebeck with us today. We'll Hello. be talking about ideas of equality in 19th century women's higher education. Before we introduce uh, Eric, let's go through the webinar protocols with you. Now, remember the webinar is being recorded and it'll be posted online on the CG website in due course and a transcript of the chat function conversation will also be posted. We usually have the webinar up within 48 hours and often within 24 hours. Now, please keep yourself muted unless you have been asked to speak or ask a question. There's no need to have your video on either during the webinar, but please do so when you're asking your questions. We recommend using speaker view in Zoom so you can more clearly see who is talking. To ask a question, use the chat function. Write your question out or, or a statement if you want to make a statement rather than asking a question uh, in the chat and, and I'll compose the Q&A discussion on the basis of what's coming in through the chat. Come in relatively early during the webinar. Uh, you're more likely then to be included in the, um, in the, in the lineup of, uh, of chat participants. When we come to you, when we want you to ask your question, I'll indicate that in advance with a message in the chat. Please unmute yourself, switch on your video and state your name and where you are from. Well, it's a pleasure to introduce Eric Liebeck, working in the emerging field of critical university studies, which a lot of us would like to think we've got some <laughs> connection to Eric. Uh, that's a, a, a good field to be in. Yes. Um, Eric. Eric's work draws on the processional and civic approaches to social knowledge and practices to make new connections between the disciplines of sociology and education. His doctoral research at Cambridge explored the history of the social and legal sciences during the late 19th century transfer of university models from Germany to America, a most important point in the history of higher education. So we benefit greatly from your historical knowledge, Eric, and your sociological insights and the screen is now yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me, um, Simon, and, and to the center in general. Thank you. Um, is my screen up now? It is. OK, that's great. So this is um, a, a history of women in higher education, especially in Britain. But um, it's a bit different than the traditional history of women's higher education. Since the 1970s, feminist academics have recovered the forgotten histories of women's participation in higher learning, but um, much of that work was focused quite sensibly on historical events occurring within women's colleges. Uh, and it explored the slow progress women made in gaining recognition within historically male universities. So this presentation has a different purpose, namely to reconsider the central influence the movement for women's higher education had on the overall trajectory of higher education during and after the 19th century. So the known history of women's higher education is will be drawn on. I'm sure there's experts uh, in the seminar that know much more about that than I. Um, and I'm not particularly adding new knowledge to that, but uh, what I'm hoping to do is to uh, think about how, what this, uh, the issues and tensions and uh, debates around that, how that might inform our understanding of um, modern era. So it's essentially a historically grounded social theory. So this is part of my uh, general theory of the academization process, which was taking place since around 1800 in core European and American nations. And whereas uh, past nav narratives emphasize the rise of industry, science, and technology, I suggest that one of the, um, that was only one of five major causes, the others being changes in elite class structure, displacement of theology, um, imperialism, and the changing roles of women and children. And so in exploring these issues surrounding women's AG, I'm uh, uh, fleshing out here the ways in which the cause D on the slide had an impact on the processual development of HE in general. So the growth and in institutionalization of women's HE was also interacting with these factors above. And because of this, certain aspects of women's higher education, um, including particularly the tension between different ethical ideals of equality 
were uh, embedded in the logic of the entire academization process. And so I conclude by noting we can still see the effects and logics of this uh, today when we um, address issues of widening access and participation to historically excluded groups. So that returning to what I called the Girton Noonan debate is worth pursuing for analytic, historic, and uh, normative purposes. So to track the significance of the debates surrounding women's higher education in Britain, we need to note the processual conditions out of which these debates emerged. While linked across the second half of the 19th century with suffragism and equality of women in legal and political spheres, we should recall that during the first half of the century, democracy and suffrage had not yet been extended to every male. Reform Acts in 1832, 1867, and 1884 did not lead to universal male suffrage, which was only achieved after World War I. So while women's suffrage campaigns grew in force after 1884, the right to vote was not obtained until 1928. This meant that in the Georgian and early Victorian context, women, like the majority of British subjects, needed to lobby their political representatives through indirect mechanisms, things like social networks and persuasion, rather than electioneering. So within elite social circles, many women, including the blue stocking circle from the 1750s, were very effective political operatives. Still, the debate surrounding the rights of men and women in the wake of the French Revolution raised this question as a matter of public concern. So most of you will be familiar with Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Women. And um, as middle-class utilitarianism um, went from James to John Stuart Mill, we could see the, uh, the son applying the logical conclusions of his philosophy to argue no distinction existed between women and men. Um, and by the 1840s, Mill's popularity amongst the younger generation of essentially male scholars, intellectuals and professionals led to a particular commitment amongst some of these um, male intellectuals towards the cause of women's equality. And in particular, a concentration of million advocates in elite universities, particularly the University of London and Cambridge meant that the women's question was debated amongst this um, elite society in, in that period. So of course, Mill's liberalism also had this kind of anglicized positivist uh, social science. Um, he was also dealing with issues around the Irish question, developing these ideas that we would today call the marketplace of ideas or the idea that um, diversity of opinion leads to better truth claims. But still, the, uh, the basis of that position is that um, there still needs to be proper education and knowledge to participate in this marketplace of ideas. And so, in fact, Mills's liberal position was closer to the bourgeois values of realism and empiricism and was not the same as the aristocratic or old regime view, which saw that liberalism as a kind of spiritless materialism. Now, that standpoint was later re-articulated by Matthew Arnold, John Ruskin, George Eliot, and others, including many of the women advocating for equal access to higher education. Indeed, it was through the social science associations in London and beyond where women, including Emily Davies, Barb Bodichon, and others found common cause with a range of politicians, philanthropists, and other reformers. One of the earliest social problems related to women's education that led to action and institutionalization involved the poor condition of governesses. So this led to the establishment of the Governesses Benevolent Institution in 1843, which was linked to the establishment of Bedford College, which is now part of Royal Holloway, University of London. So this, this whole network of social scientists included W.B. Hodgson, an examiner at the University of London, who presented his findings from having systematically reviewed the cases registered at the GBI uh, which led to uh, women becoming governesses in need. And in every instance he could find, these otherwise well-educated women's descent into dependent and precarious teaching positions, um, which you'll recognize from Jane Eyre or other um, novels of the period, was always a man's mismanagement of money. So there was negligent fathers, negligent brothers, leading families into destitution without further options for women besides 
needlework or domestic service. Uh, governess was sort of the only other option available. And this was because women were entirely dependent and precarious. So the social scientists resolved to promote a twofold solution uh, to undo this irrational waste of women's purpose, uh, channeling the general bourgeois ideal of utility. Um, this is Hodgson saying, it's needful that idleness should cease to be regarded as the happiest destiny of women. So whereas previously women plan to enter, um, only the women planning to enter teaching would take examinations, the argument was now that women, all women should be educated more or less just in case uh, they needed to go into other professions. Now, similarly, um, as we'll see, uh, some of the advocates of women's uh, education also advocated for an expansion of the professions available. But um, if again, novels of the period are really useful for going through this. So George Eliot explored this in The Mill and the Floss with the Tulliver family bending over backwards to secure their brutish son Tom's place at university while ignoring the clear giftedness and intelligence of his sister, Maggie. That novel was really significant for many of the women education reformers. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, such practical solid training would, um, would, would lead to more or less changes in the interests of um, of upper class women in particular, that was their main interest was to change the, the kind of frivolous uh, interests of women to its more practical, useful knowledge. And again, in the context of the overall academization process, this is a general trend uh, away from what's considered frivolous or leisure class activities towards utility and usefulness. So um, the second intervention would work in concert, which was the expansion of professions um, into which these educated women could then be employed. So this led to the Society for Promoting the Training of Women, founded in 1859 by Bessie Boucheret in response to an article by Harriet Martineau in Edinburgh Review. So um, expanding these occupational opportunities would result in the genuine independence of women to free themselves from these um, irresponsible men. And the premise was that um, anyone who believed that women were inferior were mistaken and that it was really just that there weren't these opportunities available. And that was the only thing that led to, in particular, um, the knowledge and, and of maths. Mathematics was like the major issue that um, everyone was worried about because um, these were particularly difficult to, uh, to to demonstrate proficiency with if you've not had any training in maths uh, at any point. So um, the SPTW by 1886 had contributed to a massive expansion of employment roles from um, 3.4 to over 70%. Um, and so, sorry, 3.4 professions to 70, including bookmaking, decorative arts, lithographs, bookbinding, and fashion. Um, so this is a list of all of these professions that they added. Um, and the last was particularly significant because um, it was deemed that it was the, um, the lack of arithmetic that led women to not be participating in their own kind of buying and, uh, or making and, and selling clothes uh, for themselves. And this is also in an era when textile manufacture was a huge issue. So among these social scientists, reformers and campaigners, uh, you have folks like um, Emily Davies, who argued that um, women should aim for employment in prestigious medical profession. And this was at a time when mo everyone was kind of focusing on Florence Nightingale's efforts to establish a separate nursing profession. but. Davies' argument was um, essentially characteristic in responding to common criticisms and then sort of working backwards to say, well, these criticisms are, are really unfounded. So the first argument was that women shouldn't work. And Davies noted that women actually already work very hard. And uh, what we would be doing is uh, moving the apportionment of mental and physical labor as currently distributed between men and women. Um, 
Others say that women suffered from ailments, including hysteria. And Davies said, well, uh, many ladies are sickly and hysterical, not strictly speaking from want of work, but from the want of some steady occupation, sufficiently interesting and important to take them out of themselves. And this goes back to what um, George Eliot and others had said in uh, Eliot, uh, Marianne Evans had, ri um, had written about uh, what she called silly novels for lady novelists, which was essentially arguing that um, that women's the idea of women's literature created such this uh, sort of frivolous idea that it really did the cause of women's education damage to think that women were only interested in these relatively superficial interests. So finally, many would argue that work would involve a loss of social position for upper class women, which is why Emily Davies was saying, well, you should, that's why we should go into uh, the profession of medicine. Um, since there would be no trade-off in status uh, position. So she contended that uh, to, for this to uh, happen, we need to first change the opinion of parents who often imagine their daughters couldn't do such work and they be needed to begin uh, educating them to the high standards expected of these um, upper learned professions. So that's what she and Barbara Bodichon, Lady Stanley, Dorothea Beale, and others endeavored to provide at Hitchin and Girton. So from the 1860s to the end of the century, Davies and other reformers lobbied and secured access to women, uh, for women to higher education, although this uh, came late uh, in places like Oxford and Cambridge. And um, the first of these two um, women's higher education institutions um, was represented by Davies and Girton and College. And this asserted an absolute categorical rejection of any idea that women were in some way ontologically existentially unequal to men. And there should be no reason or suggestion that women were unable to obtain uh, or even exceed the accomplishments of women. So that's the, the Girton model in this debate. Uh, the second model, represented by Anne Clough, Henry Sidgwick, and other founders of Newnham College, Cambridge, sought to maximize participation of women in higher education. And so what they did was they recommended practical considerations and accommodations to be applied to adjust the entry requirements to enroll and involve more women. So in each of these instances, the significance of entry examinations were really uh, paramount. So um, in fact, this led Davies to step backwards from an interest in higher education and ultimately the professions to an interest in secondary education. And she and others were involved in the 1860s in reforming the entire um, education system, not just um, higher education. But simultaneously, Davies was working with uh, folks like Henry Ackland in the Southwest to, um, to figure out how to get women to take the local examinations, which were only just being set up for the men as well. Um, and, and so a lot of these uh, examinations, it, it was difficult because um, they would, they started to allow women to take the exams, but then there was no one to mark them. So the women's colleges had to ask existing fellows to more or less voluntarily mark these exams. And as with the other issues, mathematics became a real tricky point. And, and, and that was really something that remained a, a, a big issue was because it kind of theoretically resolved this Girton Newnham tension because it, could women do mathematics as well as men? And Girton, um, in the initial round of examinations, you had 40 girls sat and 32 out of the 40 failed overwhelmingly due to the mathematics sections. Um, in other um, institutions, uh, Durham opened their local exams and, and there was a range of different openings of, of examinations. But by the, by the end of the century, um, the Girton uh, students had managed to become, uh, I believe it was the eighth Wrangler in mathematics. So that was a really significant achievement was for the, for the uh, Girton student 
to be essentially among the the top mathematicians in the in the world and that was really kind of a significant achievement now um by the uh this is this is kind of what is going on at Girton, and Emily Davies has this really strong belief that if you admit that women couldn't do what men could do, that was an admission of women's inequality. And that's why I'm suggesting that there are two separate ideas of equality here. One would be women can do everything that men can do, but better, or at least as well. And then the other version, which is um, at Newnham, founded in 1871 by Anne Clough um, was set up for a very different set of reasons and, um, and, and, and those are worth looking at as well. So firstly, Clough's work was to educate women largely in the north of England and had been going since at least 1867, establishing the North of England Council for Promoting the Higher Education of Women. And Anne was the sister of one of the last and most well-regarded romantic poets, Arthur Clough. Uh, and she moved back to Liverpool after his premature death to educate his children. So, but prior to that, she had experienced a lot of this kind of social reform activities in London um, earlier in, this, in the century. And so she set up this North of England um, public lecture circuit in Manchester, Leeds, Le Liverpool, Barry, and other northern cities. So this, on the one hand, provided considerable momentum for the cause of women's higher education or women's education, but also led to the uh, foundation of the university extension movement when James Stewart, a Cambridge uh, academic, accepted an inv invitation to speak and there and discovered this huge untapped and unmet demand for higher learning in the north of England. And, and a lot of that story gets told as a kind of working men's extension movement and so forth. But the, at, certainly initially, the overwhelming majority of the audience for these public lectures were women, especially middle class women interested in education um, and so forth. So um, this is what Clough is doing. Meanwhile, at Cambridge, um, it's not exactly the same uh, as, as what's going on um, at Oxford with, um, this is after the Oxford movement, but that's still kind of like a big issue there. At Cambridge, you have um, what Roth, Sheldon Rothblatt calls the revolution of the dons, which is essentially formalizing and professionalizing the younger college fellows as academics and, and sort of taking in the tutorial um, work into the colleges uh, and creating this kind of relational uh, fellow and student bond. And again, that all eventually goes back to Thomas Arnold and so on. So some of the major figures there were J.R. Seeley, Henry Jackson, Henry Sidgwick, and um, they were building on their, their own education as well as this idea of like muscular Christianity, this athletic team, as well as this kind of underlying liberalism, a lot of it inspired by Mill and so forth. So one of these folks was Henry Sidgwick. And Sidgwick, um, like Arthur Clough uh, before his death, uh, resigned his fellowship because uh, they didn't want to have this... Um, they, 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 they were essentially protesting the requirement of the 39 articles of the Church of England for membership in, the, in Cambridge and Oxford. And so they, they was kind of uh, a protest in favor of religious tolerance. But because of this, Sidgwick was now self-employed as a tutor and he started to get involved in the establishment of Newnham College. And in his correspondence with Anne Clough, um, he recommended that she take up the role of mistress of Newnham College. So between the two of them, they, they sort of construct this uh, Newnham College, which has this very different ideal. And a part of that is just practical, where because a lot of the women coming to Newnham were coming from the north of England, um, they had a very different need from the Girton folks who were coming, a lot of them from London and the Northern home counties and so on. 
Um, and furthermore, both of them, of the colleges had very different needs to those of the male bachelors that were in, in the other colleges. So um, Girton College was founded 2.5 miles away and Newnham College had uh, a very particular uh, housing setup. Uh, but essentially what Sidrick started to realize along with Clough was that um, the women were not getting the marks necessary on the entrance examinations and again, particularly noting the mathematics. And so Sidgwick recommended uh, a different set of exams would be constructed for women to make sure that as many as possible could join. And then the idea was that they would then educate them to a high standard and then they could you know, do as well as they could on the examinations. And so that premise, it, 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 it sort of makes practical sense that uh, they want to get as many women as possible involved but the premise was actually re revolting to Emily Davies, who felt that women should not be handicapped in any way and they needed to be held to the same standards as men. And so this is really where we start to see this, this tension is, is, is almost the two separate approaches to widening access and participation. The one is based off of the equality of the sexes and the expectation that academic standards must be upheld. And then you have the Newnham ideal that the equality of sexes should be achieved through um, handicapping the individuals and in effect lowering the standards in order to encourage greater participation. And so, in fact, this tension sort of remains throughout the entire academic process. So this happens in the 19th century, but in many ways you could still see this tension happening, especially at places like Oxford and Cambridge all the way up until the 1970s when you have co-education being introduced and so forth. And I don't, I don't quite know how much more time I, I have or if I should start to wrap up or anything. I think you can, can keep going, Eric. It's very interesting and um, you know, give yourself another eight or so minutes perhaps. Okay, that sounds good. Great, so, so uh, there's Emily Davies and, um, and Clough and, and everyone. And the other thing that's interesting about this idea, because it's it's this kind of tension between uh, the standards. So looking back at the end of the process, Emily Davies says things like, um, even though, so even though early on women were associated with certain subjects, music and uh, literature, and the men were associated with science and mathematics and so forth, she was really pleased that by the end of the 19th century that she felt that these standards had sort of merged. And that was always her kind of idea was that we shouldn't really just change the standards entirely to accommodate um, women because it would, it would always lead to this kind of alternative, sort of second class status for women. And also she feared along with others at the time that this would be a result in what George Eliot called the debasing of the moral currency. And this was a really significant issue. There were lots of um, folks, including um, John Percival, who started the University of Bristol. This kind of idea, he, he was explicitly drawing on George Eliot um, when he was setting up uh, Clifton College in, in Bristol or Somerset and so on. So it's worth reading this quote. So. George Eliot is saying, this is what I call the debasing of the moral currency, lowering the value of every inspiring fact and tradition so that it will command less and less of the spiritual products, the generous motives which sustain the charm and elevation of our social existence, the something besides bread which by which man saves his soul alive. And then he says, um, let the moral, or she says, let the moral currency be emptied of its value let a greedy buffoonery debase all historic beauty, majesty, and pathos. And the more you will heap up the desecrated symbols, the greater will be the lack of the ennobling emotions which subdue the tyranny of suffering and make ambition one with social virtue. And so this is also really similar to some arguments that Matthew Arnold was making at the time. John Ruskin would make these types of arguments. And it's essentially saying if you give everything over to this utilitarian sort of spiritless idea, 
what you end up doing and and if you just say well we want everyone to go into education for and and we will just get rid of the whole knowledge that they're trying to acquire you're actually uh debasing the whole thing that you're providing the access to and so there it's it's not simply this issue of equality and and does that mean that there's a biological inferiority for men and women but um is there something that gets lost if you just widen participation without thinking about how you're going to conserve what Elliot's calling the moral currency um, as you expand it. And uh, similarly, um, this is, I, I didn't intend to do this plug, but next week I'm gonna be uh, doing a talk on our, our new um, academic college channel on the relationship between Elliot's idea. There's also um, Matthew Arnold, Nietzsche is making similar ideas in Germany. You have W.B. Du Bois making similar uh, arguments in the United States. At this moment where you're starting to see expansion of education, there's a lot of this concern about how do we preserve what's good about the kind of elitist education um, and how do we expand and how do we deliver that and, and, and widen access to that rather than just remove all of those things. And I don't think, and I think even uh, Davies, I'll, I'll just kind of um, conclude by just saying that even Davies by the end of this process realized that this wasn't, a, a, you know, it's not an either or situation and that they, these both she and Anne Clough worked together um, to, to progress the cause of women's higher education across the century and, and they really achieved a huge amount and, and, and set up many of the conditions that led to um, political suffrage uh, over that next turn of the century. But um, I think it's still worth thinking about some of these uh, links to the wider history of, of education that's that are still with us. So there's still quite a lot to do. This is really just an introduction of, for myself into some of these issues really picking up on this particular uh, uh, tension I noticed within Girton and Newnham ideals. Uh, but there's lots of comparative analysis that we could do. There's also some very, uh, and very interesting links with the imperial dimension of the academization process. Um, as I mentioned, co-education in the 1970s, there was a huge debate about whether co-education would lower the standards in the women's colleges uh, like Somerville um, because the highest ability uh, women students would go to the top Oxford male colleges, therefore reducing the reputation of the kind of women's colleges. And that was a debate all the way, I mean, 1970s, that's not, that wasn't very long ago. And similarly, I think there's still issues, certainly if you look at Oxford um, University, the equivalent of the, um, the fair access agreements now. Right up until 2000, there's always a question about how do you widen access while retaining these standards? And what's very interesting is that in 2000, that discussion stops because at that point, they're starting to report directly to the Office for Fair Access. And so they're no longer engaged in their own questions, which they, you could, you could see someone somewhere like Oxford is worried about this for hundreds of years. But all of a sudden, by 2000, they're explicitly engaging with the government and they're just providing the statistics that the government needs with the one exception that Oxford and Cambridge have the odd state school versus independent school ratio, which is, the, I think they're the only two that have that as a consideration. But yeah, I'm just um, really curious to know what others think about this idea, um, whether you think it's relevant, um, what other avenues it might be uh, worth exploring. But thank you very much for having me and for listening to the talk. Thanks, Eric, that was really rich. And uh, I think you know, a lot of people will, found it, will have found that very interesting. We, we, we um, noticed with this webinar that your, um, although you had, a, I think, 70 registrations, your um, actual take up, your participation ratio is one of the highest we've had at almost two thirds <laughs> of those registrations have come in. So. You know, we've had very good numbers actually considering and, um, uh, you know, historic topics, um, they don't necessarily 
appear, appear to people as, you know, utilitarian and useful for their studies at the on the day. But you know, when once the webinar starts, people get absorbed by the by the content, yeah, and that's yeah, what's yeah. happened today. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question, then I'm going to pass to to Mike Ratcliffe. We've got a couple more people coming in as well. Um, my question is really about race and whether that intersects with the gender discussion at all in, in the late 19th century period the, and the contrasting examples of Goethe and Newham, you know, that you've talked about. I mean, does, does race figure in the, in the dialogue at all? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I haven't seen as much explicitly on race, but I had seen many um, arguments there's a there's a really striking um, cartoon that was used in in some of the campaigns that uh, focused on the mentally disabled and uh, criminals and as the male suffrage was extending, the women were saying, "How could you allow these um, essentially non-educated, potentially mentally disabled um, men vote?" but you won't let this highly educated university led um, women to vote or sorry to, to uh, yeah, to vote. And so my sense is that to the extent that there would be an issue around race, it would actually be very complicated and intersectional in that these were largely uh, middle and upper class women making the case for higher education alongside um, very often it's their their brothers that they're in competition with and and actually some of the biggest advocates for women's higher education were folks like um which is the chocolate in bristol um there's like a chocolate um starts with an f um but yeah there's the, cho the um, chocolate air um, fries fries fries. Yes, fries yes fries exactly so fry had I think four or five daughters and no sons. And so he really invested heavily in women's education. And I think University of Bristol admitted women right away. Um, and it was all part of this kind of uh, middle-class, upper-class conflict. That's, that's kind of my, and then those groups in general have really complex relationships to things like imperialism, um, you know, when they're going abroad and settling in India and setting up schools, all of that is very complicated. Um, and I wouldn't guess, although I'm not saying for certain, I wouldn't guess that it was entirely um, ethical by today's standards, for example. Probably needs quite a bit of decolonization. Thanks, Eric. Um, Mike Ratcliffe. Thanks, Eric. That, that, that's really interesting. Thank you for that. Oh, so thanks. I'm, I'm interested in, in whether there's a coincidence here with the curriculum change that's happening at the end of the 19th century. All the, the new specialised degrees. So London sets a pace by having new degrees. Oxford and Cambridge decide to have specialised honours examinations. But, but clearly London managed to decide that they're going to have some just for women. Mm -hmm. Whereas Oxford and Cambridge don't do that. They don't, they don't go in that kind of thing. And obviously there's this kind of I think the worst example I've come across is the um, the King's College Department for Women who comes up with the BSc in Household and Social Science, mm -hmm. which an, an examination that includes doing the washing up. So th there's a kind of really weird kind of, do we have curriculum for women and how does that work? Or the extent to which that's just part of uh, a kind of broadening. And, and there's things like the, the whole compulsory Greek argument and that mm -hmm. Is that about the education? Is it about gender? Is it about class? And and how do we how do we get to kind of really understanding which of those factors are most prevalent in the, in that? Yeah, well, I think that's exactly the the issue is that it's it's so they're all overlapping and intersectional in those ways. So that it is there are issues of gender, but then there are also issues of class, and they aren't necessarily um you know moving in the same direction so they create these real big um tensions i think i'm i'm just thinking out loud in terms of um some of the the different so the the issue of greek 
and Latin was really significant, especially from the 20th century towards about 1960 or so, because essentially that was really, it was considered necessary to open up to sciences because a lot of the male engineers and scientists didn't really want to learn uh, Greek and Latin because it wasn't relevant to what, very often they learned German or something like that. Um, and yet a lot of the examinations required things like two Greek and Latin languages. And, and so they were trying to reform those, maybe get rid of one of the languages and replace it with a modern foreign language. But one of the things that was really interesting was that the headmistresses of girls schools at the time said, this won't affect us at all. We're going to keep teaching Greek and Latin because we are training um, the female students for the arts and humanities. It was more or less assumed that women went into the arts and humanities subjects and science were for other people. And that was something that Girton always pushed against. Girton always really had these like really elaborate laboratories and and scientific equipment and really pushed um, mathematics. And I think that uh, that all goes back to this uh, early idea of Emily Davies, which was that, you know, um, women should be in the most elite positions in society. Uh, and that was what higher education was for. And there's some great essays by Davies talking about, you know, a lot of people think, a lot of people at the time thought women's education should be to make them a good wife. And they said, well, sure, men's education should also make them a good husband, but it's also assumed that you would also do other things as well. And so that, that she kind of always has this way of like very politely turning the question on its head to say, well, sure, domestic, what is it, doing the washing up? You know, that's probably good for everyone to know how to do. Maybe men should take that degree as well, but then they, what about everything else? that um, men are assumed to know how to do, that women should also know how to do as well. Thank you both. Um, can we bring in Harriet, Harriet Truscott at this point? Hi, Simon. Um, actually, my, mine was not a question so much as intended as a response directly to uh, Mike Ratcliffe. Mm -hmm. um, to, to note that um, that some of these some of these courses which sound extraordinary to us were in fact uh, had a great emphasis on um, on biochemistry uh, mm -hmm. what we would now see as biochemistry um, under the guise of domestic science mm -hmm. yeah, and and a lot of the domestic science degrees were part of a general philanthropic science which were um, designed towards helping um, the poor with hygiene and, and, and those types of issues. So it was kind of an overlap with what we would today call social work, but also with a kind of, as you said, this natural scientific biochemistry. Um, so it, it wasn't quite um, what it sounds like today. It was, a, it was much more embedded in, in things like um, social work and philanthropy. Thanks, uh, Harriet, and thanks, Eric. Uh, Lindsay, Lindsay Hurst, please. Lindsay. Oh. Hello, sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so as somebody who graduated from Girton College last year, I'm currently mm -hmm. at Fitzwilliam College, moved slightly further down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really interesting to hear more about the history of those colleges. And also quite interesting in what's happening at the moment, I mean, certainly in terms of Lucy Cavendish College, mm -hmm. which I, I think is no longer a female only college. It's now sort of a mixed college. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting as well regarding like, the whole transgender issue as well and how that's affecting women's education. So what are your thoughts on that? Right. Um, yeah, so there's <laughs> lots, lots of issues there. Um, so Lucy Cavendish is a very interesting, d d founded at a different point in time, also linked as much to the women's education issues as to mature students, um, uh, accommodation of mature students. In, um, so um, 
how to organize what would have been the mature students associations into colleges and so forth. Um, so that's a different, so, and then Girton, well, yeah, so Girton and, well, Girton went co-educational and then Newnham is still women's only. At least it was when I was, I went to Girton as well. So <laughs> uh, it's, it's sort of where my interest in all of this started was, um, walking through the corridor system, because one of the things that was also really interesting was why it was set up as a corridor rather than a staircase is because they had a plan B, which was to make uh, them into hospitals if they needed to, if the college plan didn't work out, they could be a hospital. But um, I'm just trying to remember the other um, issue that you mentioned um, regarding, um, re regarding the changes because it's actually re related to um, some of the international issues that Simon and others um, deal with because actually some of these colleges, uh, Girton in particular has quite a large estate. It actually can accommodate quite large numbers, um, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily well known uh, compared to places like um, Trinity College, St. John's. Mm -hmm. And so particularly for international students who just say, I don't, I don't know what college to go to, put me anywhere. Um, a very large number of them end up in Girton. And so actually what I've noticed in the past 10 years, I, I started in 2011, um, is the proportion of um, Asian students at Girton is really dramatically expanded from it being maybe 10, 20%. I would guess that it's probably over 60% at this point. And so that's an interesting Th phenomenon that's just uh, you know what is the sociology of that um is really worth thinking about as well okay thank you mm -hmm. thanks lindsay thanks eric again and helen helen carasso is next hi hello simon hello eric good to see you again hi. hello um hi before i go into my question i should admit that my mother is a graduate of the aforementioned course at kcl um, it was actually Queen Elizabeth College for Women, and uh, she did it during wartime, and a lot of it was about um, food science, and um, you know, was you know, in times of rationing, it fits in with a marguerite pattern way of doing cooking. But it was a slightly bizarre phenomenon when I first discovered about it. But sorry, that's an aside. What I really wanted to ask you was um, this: from when I first read the abstract, this sounded to me very much like the current debate about contextual data. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned access agreements and access and participation plans and the um, commitments that universities now make. Of course, they're all very much evaluated. Mm -hmm. Is there any evidence about how these different approaches impacted on either the profile of students who admitted or outcomes at the end of degrees in one in effect taking a contextual data approach and the other mm. setting exactly the same admission standard? Yeah, well, I think, um, I don't know the exact figures. I don't know if they were tracked. I'm sure that they were, but I just don't know. But my sense is from the discussions of the letters and so forth that they're writing at the time, that Girton had a much harder time of getting their enrollment up to what they needed it to be compared to Newnham, um, which uh, sort of in many ways, um, I can really appreciate the Newnham idea, which is they, they sort of looked at each individual student and thought, okay, well, what are their needs? Are they coming up and down from Manchester every other week? Um, and so do they need a particular accommodations to make that happen? Um, rather than sort of saying, you know, there's one way of doing things, you, you either learn how to do it or not, which is much more the Girton approach. And, and if you imagine you have, um, a bright uh, woman student, um, you know, they have a choice of which one to go towards. And the one is really, uh, you know, pitches itself as high standards, intimidating, kind of like, we're going to do it and do it with gusto. And then you've got the other that's much more open and, and sort of, uh, sort of, even in the way that the domestic arrangements for, for how, how the women were staying in the quarters were much more um, accommodating and sort of comfortable 
and and sort of uh, where, whereas the uh, uh, Emily Davies was very austere and sort of very uh, you know work work oriented. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'd have to look to confirm, but my sense is that uh, the Newnham recruited much much better than the Girton. And, and was there any difference in the way that the two colleges were received by the rest of the academic community because of this difference? Was one seen to be one of us and the other seemed to be not? Um, by the academic community, like the, the male academic community in Cambridge? Yeah, basically, yeah. Um, I don't think either were accepted as, as being part of... Uh, I think, I think you have the people like Henry Sidgwick and some of the other millions who were significant in what the reforms going on behind the scenes and, and what Cambridge would kind of become. But most of the population of male fellows, certainly the students, I mean, they, they were hanging effigies of women on bicycles and so forth. Um, and there's this big debate about new the new woman and 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 wearing trousers and smoking cigarettes and these types of things and and both and this is something actually that my wife does a lot more um, of the history on the sort of representations in things like Gilbert and Sullivan and and poems. Uh, women's education was considered a really like a, a moral crisis going on at the time that this was like the end of civilization to have women learning these things um, that they shouldn't be learning. Thank you. Sure. Elil, Elil Cohen. Hello, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Eric. It's been really, really interesting. Just um, a minor point of clarification I'd like to ask if that's all right. It's, um, but it, it's just a minor point, but it seems quite relevant, which is, um, was George Eliot, my memory, I did read a biography of hers by um, Rosemary Ashton, I think a few years ago. And my memory is that she, when she was writing these, the kind of things that you've been citing from her today, she would have been using her real name, if I remember rightly. And do you think, is that right? Or would have she been sometimes using the name George Eliot when she was writing these essays? Because it's, it's only minor, but it seems like it's also relevant, isn't it? If she was- yeah writing this as a, a yeah outwardly as a woman or not yeah i think that's right um i i'm not as familiar with her biography the published text that i've drawn the quotations from had george Eliot as mm. the author okay. um but those are you know fourth fifth edition so i i, sh I could go back and, and check the dates they are towards the end of her life that she's writing these kind of nonfiction essays these kind of like moral commentary um i forget the name of the book now but it's it's she's also adopting like another pseudonym uh i think it's like dr clausus or something it, it's like a part she she's adopting another persona that's not George Eliot at that point. So it could have still been ambiguous. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it gets lost sometimes, doesn't it? When somebody uses a pseudonym, it's not I forget when yeah. they are, when they're not. But okay. there's a there's a really interesting um, description that Emily Davies has in her papers of visiting George Eliot or, or Marianne Lewis at the end of her life. And it sounds like Marianne Lewis just was essentially like modern life is completely rubbish and, and that everything about it was just d decadent and decayed. And, and even, even um, Emily Davies was a bit like, wow, that's like really ext extreme, like tone it down a little bit. Um, so that, that's, it seems like she was at that stage of her life where she was really frustrated. I don't think that she, considered herself to have progressed things. Although I think in in hindsight, I think that hers was one of the major achievements of the century, both in literature and social commentary. Indeed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. Um, what I'll do now, Eric, is take a bunch of questions at once if I can, and if you can jot sure. down your responses as we go, so you'll be able to come out with them all at the end. Sure. Yeah. Um, the first two questions are going to be from two of our regular 
uh, participants in the webinar series, Victorita Triff and uh, David Law, and then we'll bring in Naomi Hetherington and Astrid Favela. So colleagues be ready for that. Uh, and let's start then with Victorita. Hi, uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, congratulations, Eric. I'm very interested in the um, uh, policy on the future. Uh, so my question is related to this area. Uh, what is the future of uh, women in higher education in your opinion, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Second question then from David Law. Thank you, Simon. Uh, and thank you very much, Eric. Uh, I wish I knew more about this subject. Um, my question is really about the connection between uh, religious nonconformity mm -hmm. and the desire to achieve emancipation through education on a non-gendered basis. Um, and of course, it was the reference to Fry's in Bristol, which has prompted this, but I just don't know whether in Cambridge there was anything of, of that sort. I'm minded to add the comment that we sometimes forget uh, how even in the late 19th century, there were all sorts of discriminations. Only 1871, I think, was the University Tests Act, you know, where uh, non-Anglicans uh, could actually be seen on any kind of equal footing uh, with Anglicans. So there's a very deep connection between religion and higher education in the UK, as I'm sure you're aware. Our third uh, question comes from Naomi, Naomi Hetherington. Hi, thank you very much, Eric. Um, something that occurred to me as you were speaking, um, and as someone who's an undergraduate uh, at Newnham, and one of the figures that I did my PhD on was Amy Levy, who is a very uh, early student at Newnham. Um, and a lot of my teaching since has been in the continuing education lifelong learning sector. Um, one of the queries that has always uh, arisen about Levy was why she didn't, in a reticomus, finish her studies at Newnham. Um, and of course, a lot of Newnham students, um, one of the, uh, a part of this more flexible model was not just in their entrance requirements, but their studies when they got there, mm -hmm. um, that they didn't have to do the full tripos. Um, and I know when I was researching Levy, this flexibility was presented uh, you know, to me as a as a very um, a kind of very positive aspect of the Newnham model. Um, ironically, uh, I got my current job uh, through a big restructure um, at a university which offered uh, alter an alternative pattern of study um, for lifelong stu learning students to be able to uh, gain a, a degree at a pace that was right for them. Mm -hmm. um, and along with much of the rest of the sector. Um, this is now gone. Um, and a lot of the arguments um, around the restructure um, was precisely this argument of bringing in something uh, around um, kind of standard standardizations. And the program that I now teach on um, is a foundation year program where uh, we then equip students to do a pathway degree and study mm -hmm. a degree, you know, at the same um department at the same pace as everybody else mm -hmm. um so i i don't have any answers here um but it in, in thinking about how these questions are relevant to today um and i know there's there's a sort of separate debate around continuing education that goes back to the 19th century as well um and figures figures like carpenter who i want was a friend of levy's um but but that that felt very alive to me um, mm -hmm, as an area mm -hmm. where, where this early debate could speak to today. Definitely. And our final question comes from Astrid Favela. Yes. Uh, hi, um, hi everyone. Thanks for this presentation. Um, my question is uh, simply whether uh, in the historical period that you've considered and uh, universities of uh, Cambridge and Oxford, uh, early women dropout was an issue at all. Thank you. Well, there's four questions for you, Eric, um, and you'll be closing the webinar with these uh, with this response. So okay. Over to you. Um, well, thank you, thank you for all of these questions. I mean, it, it goes to show just how much there is kind of to pursue. Um, hopefully, this uh, paper, which is in my book, University Revolution, 
um, is, is kind of a starting point for some of these questions. Certainly the religious conformity is overlapping um, in, in lots of really significant ways. Um, and, and in general, the reason I think that this issue of women's higher education is so important uh, in setting the terms of higher education in general is because you have things like religious inclusion, gender inclusion, class inclusion, all happening. And now, now we're talking about, you know, um, greater ethnic um, participation, ethnic minority participation, different um, inclusion of, of um, sexuality and, and different forms of identity. Meanwhile, we're still trying to push past the 50% kind of um, targets uh, for young people. And I think going to the question about what's the future of women's higher education in future, I mean, I think actually we're sort of, women are the first ones past the key threshold of, that we need to be looking at, which is women's now, women's participation now exceeds men in a lot of advanced industrial countries. And yet we're not seeing the, the, um, the results of that at the same rate as the participation. And I think this goes to some of the issues um, Naomi mentioned in terms of the flexibility um, of, of what should be a kind of professional and or lifelong learning process that has this kind of accommodation for each individual at where they are at. And I think that this issue of the Gert and Newnham debate is, is interesting to think that through, not necessarily to choose one of the sides, but do you just hold the standards exactly the same or do you change the standards? And there's kind of trade-offs in either way, but I think that um, if, if I was interested in, in prescriptively suggesting a solution to some of these problems, it's to increase flexibility, to be a bit more uh, accommodating on not focusing so much on 18 year olds and thinking about people at all different stages of their lives. And, 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 and I think that the women um, pushing their way into the ivory tower, I suppose, uh, really provide a model for how to, how to kind of do that and how to think through the ethics of that as well. <clears throat> I have to say, um very warm thank you eric for your contribution today i think that everyone's really enjoyed it really learned a lot and you know your slides and your delivery very effective and uh brought us into this whole world and and some decades of it uh and um i noticed a lot of very positive comments coming through and mark ratcliffe has in fact posted a clapping symbol on <laughs> on, on his name in the webinar so we look That's forward right. to having you back when you've got more historical revelations for us. Gender, of course, is really important and interesting to all of us, and yeah. its intersections with class and, and race in the present context are especially interesting. But uh, you know what an important struggle it was, you know, historically, how how it's opened up the struggle of so many others. I think the struggle of women, the struggle of half of half of humanity to be recognised, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, I'm sure it's a theme that. Well, it, 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 it continues to come up again and again because, because all these, these systems of power intersect and um, gender issues are always there. Um, next uh, webinar, folks, on Thursday takes us to the uh, relationship that we often um, investigate, which is the relationship between China, higher education in China and the rest of the world. And in particular, China's Young Talents Program. You know, what happens when the returnees go back to China? Uh, and that will be presented by Giulio Marini and Lily Yang. Uh, and we look forward to speaking with them in two days' time. I hope all the people who've taken part in this webinar will come back again on Thursday and in subsequent webinars. And we look forward to seeing you all then. Once again, Eric, thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Thanks. <laughs>